Hello, I'm Jim Levis from m and and I'm here today with Linda Yu, who is a Fellow of Economics at St Edmund Hall, Oxford, and also an adjunct professor at the London Business School. You'll also know her, of course, from the BBC and also from Bloomberg TV. Now, we're here today to talk about her new book called The Great Economist, where she looks at history's 12 best-known economists, but most importantly asks the question, how can we learn from what they told us in the past to deal with the economic problems of the day? Hello, Linda. Hello, Jim. So, Linda, your book goes from the 18th century with Adam Smith all the way to the present day uh, with Robert Solo, who's still with us uh, right now. How did you choose who to put in and who to leave out? Well, it was really a tough choice. So I focused on the economists who really gave us the seminal ideas behind how markets work and those who focused on economic growth. So that helped me narrow the field. And then, of course, within that, I've got two centuries of economists <laughs> from the great classical economists who explained how markets actually worked at the start of the Industrial Revolution, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, how trade happened, leading all the way to the growth economists like Douglas North and Robert Solo that um, you also had mentioned. There's a lot of economists who could have been included and some of them are sort of included. So, uh, Paul Samuelson, who is very well known for a range of issues, but specifically on how trade creates unequal gains within a country. He's included in the epilogue. And others like Hyman Minsky, because his theories really do help explain how the last bubble came about. And then, of course, coupled with Irving Fisher, we get a theory of how bubbles come up out and then debt deflation which follows so not every economist might make it to the cover but there's quite a lot of economists whose work um, are discussed in the book so let's think about some of those current economic problems facing the world we've obviously been in a period of globalization for, for a few decades now but there appears to be some pushback to that uh, Trump's renegotiating NAFTA there's US and Chinese trade wars and of course brexit who of the great historical economics teachers should we look at to learn about what's going on with trade right now? Oh, well, David Ricardo would be best place. He's known as the father of international trade. His own background, I think, gives a sense as to why it is these great economists really do have something to offer us today. He started off as a successful investor. He bet the right way on the Battle of Waterloo. When he made his money, I suppose, he became less interested in making money, and he picked up a copy of The Wealth of Nations, perchance, on a trip to Bath. And from that, he wrote the trade model that's still with us today, comparative advantage. He explains why it's advantageous for countries to trade, even if another country is more efficient at producing everything. So specialization leads to efficiency. Efficiency leads to stronger economic growth. And Ricardo was also very focused on different classes within a society, those who are against trade, those are for trade. In his time, it was the landowners who were protectionists and against trade, and his arguments about why repealing the protectionist corn laws that protected grain, so that's therefore the landowners, um, really benefited um, the economy. And you saw that, because after the repeal of the corn laws in 1856, um, England flourished and that really brought about a period of prosperity. So as we look at the challenge to globalization today, I think it's important to remind ourselves of what it is that globalization has accomplished over the past 200 years where really we are in a prosperous time. And his work was built upon by those like Paul Samuelson who said an implication from what Ricardo says is that you will have winners, those who work in the areas which the country is specializing in and producing more of, and then there'll be losers. And from that, you can work out how can you better prepare the losers from trade, those whose jobs are under threat, whose wages are stagnating. So by able to identify winners and losers more clearly for every country, but understanding how globalization has benefited us all, Ricardo and those who followed him, I think, have really um, set the um, ground for how we can better reform trade when it doesn't quite work for everyone. And probably the distributional impact is one of the big reasons for the backlash against globalization. Um, but in the book I discuss there's lots of ways that one can do that once you're clear um, what the causal factors are and then therefore the solutions that would follow.
I guess another feature of the global economy is just how much debt has built up. Even since the great financial crisis, we now have more debt in the global system than we did before. If you add together government debt, household debt and corporate debt, and at the same time we have persistently low and weak inflation. Who can we look to to learn about what might be the best response to that kind of debt, low inflation environment? Well, the great economist, best place to talk about that is Irving Fisher. So he is the person who came up with the theory of debt deflation. And you won't be surprised to hear, Jim, he came up with it during the Great Depression, which was the last systemic banking crisis that raised the prospect of debt overhang, essentially causing a stagnant period of growth. So Irving Fisher, by the way, is normally not included in books like this because he also famously in 1929 predicted that the stock market was on a permanently high plateau. And then after the great crash of 1929, he said that the market was on the up again. So he wasn't so great at forecasting markets and it destroyed his reputation. But his economic ideas around how you can avoid um, debt leading to deflation, which is persistent price falls, um, really has a place then and now. Because obviously in the 1930s, um, there was a second recession after the Great Depression. It hit around 1938 when everyone thought actually um, the economy was recovering. And one of the reasons was, um, well, there's a number of reasons, but one of the reasons that um, Irving Fisher highlighted is the economy was deflating. So in other words, um, when you have price falls, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so we see it in modern day Japan, which also had a real estate crash in the early 90s. Um, but because people expect after such a crash and they're repaying debt, they don't borrow and therefore their spending is constrained anyways because they're repaying debt and so are banks rebuilding balance sheets. And they expect prices to fall in the future because that's what deflation is, falling prices. People put off purchases and investment. And that scenario is, in Japan's case, even worse than what we saw in the Great Depression because we've had about three decades of stagnation. So Irving Fisher's theories say that in order to avoid that scenario, um, the central bank really must reflate the economy. So in other words, one of the causes of the Great uh, Depression, why it was so great, was a contraction in the money supply. So if you have deflation, the way to combat it is reflation. And, um, the central banks of today, after the 2008 crisis, seem to have learned that lesson and they have pumped out extraordinary amounts of money to keep the economy um, from falling into a debt deflation spiral uh, through quantitative easing, um, injection of cash and, um, and the like. It doesn't mean there aren't problems with that, which I deal with in another chapter on yeah. um, dealing with um, Milton Friedman, but Irving Fisher's ideas were then built upon by Ben Bernanke, who was obviously Fed chairman during the um, 2008 banking crisis, and he took Fisher's ideas, built that into his own theories, and I think really steered the United States so that the U.S., as you know, is actually the epicenter of the crisis, but also its banks and co corporates were the first to recover. And that is, I think, in part due to learning the lessons of history. One of the great things about the global economy right now is just how low unemployment rates are around the world. We have pretty much record low unemployment rates in the UK, in the US and even in Japan. Yet at the same time, the rate of wage growth is really very disappointingly low. What can be done about that and who can teach us what we should do and explain why it's happening? Joan Robinson, um, she was the most influential female economist of the 20th century, included um, in my book. Her work was on what's called monopsony. So monopoly is when firms have market power in product markets. Monopsony is when employers have market power in labor markets. So she was the first to come up with the concept of disguised or hidden unemployment, which is actually one of the causes of low wages. If you want a full-time job, but you can only get a part-time job, then your wages are going to be much lower. Um, but that's not normally measured in unemployment statistics because um, you have a job, so therefore you're employed. Except for the United States, which has a U6 measure of unemployment, which tends to be double the official unemployment rate. So it picks up those who are um, in this disguised category. So her work 
really um, identified and she also did this in the 1930s um, because unemployment became a big issue during the Great Depression. She was a disciple of John Maynard Keynes who of course upended conventional wisdom and looked at issues like um, unemployment, like wage stickiness. So in other words, if you don't have complete flexibility in labor markets, you can have instances where unemployment is stuck at a very high level, and of course, wages are also stuck um, at a low level. The interesting tidbit about Joan Robinson is that she was very privileged to be one of the five um, Cambridge economists and Keynes' inner circle. Um, she was also married to one of them, and she had an affair with another one. So she had three, I would say in many ways, votes in this, uh, in this council. Um, but the big insight that Joan Robinson gave us is that if labor markets are not competitive, then you can have low wages because firms um, are not facing competition to lose workers if they don't pay them what they're worth. So if you look at the issue of low wages, there's a number of factors which I um, cover in her chapter. Um, but if you look at the United States, wages have been stagnant for 40 years, median wages. So that's the wage of the median person in the income distribution taking out inflation. Germany and Japan stagnant for 20 years. In Britain, wages have been stagnant for a decade. So what is the solution to the stagnation? It depends on the context of different countries, but what they share in common in Joan Robinson's view is a lack of competition in certain sectors. So in other words, we have automation, which is clearly putting pressure on jobs, which actually you would think um, increases competition for um, workers. But what it's actually done is that it's increased um, labor demand for high-end and low-end workers, whereas automation has hollowed out the middle. So by looking at what Robinson would look at, which is the structure of the labor market, you can start to get a sense of where the labor market isn't working very well, and then to use that to improve the flexibility of that um, labor market. So her work would explain why wages are stagnant today, and more importantly, um, different ways to deal with it. So while we're talking about Joan Robinson, I guess what is clear from your book is that there's only one woman out of the 12 uh, chapters that you talk about and economics right now has this bad reputation like many sciences of being very white and male dominated at the same time we also have a problem in economics that it seems very focused on mathematics nowadays and maybe has lost touch with the real world and couldn't explain what went wrong in the great financial crisis so could you touch on some things like Richard Thaler and behavioral economics and where does economics go now compared to where it's come from historically? Um, I think economics um, is in a period of change, is that the best way to describe it? I think there is a recognition that um, economists are not very diverse and um, I think historically, of course, um, women were excluded from higher education um, in many uh, respects and economics um, is part of, I think, uh, that um, uh, one of the subjects for which it was difficult for women even who studied it to get degrees and therefore to find employment so I think that's certainly um, something that is changing and I think um, economics today is still a profession where by one measure um, so this is um, an index of a research economists around the world um, fewer than a fifth of all um, academic or research economists are women and that's obviously um, a reflection both of the history but also I think a need to um, to think harder um, about how to make um, the economics profession um, more inclusive. Um, the, um, the profession itself has issues that it's considering beyond diversity, of course. As we know from the 2008 crisis, I think there is a sense that um, economics um, needs to have more real world incorporation. So I think in the book, I trace how economics went from being a subject rooted in the big issues of the day, the seminal economists all dealt with the biggest questions, whether it's the protectionist corn laws or the industrial revolution. Um, 
and they were philosophers. Um, they weren't mathematicians. In fact, several of them were pretty poor at mathematics. Um, but at the turn of the last century, um, neoclassical economics, um, so Alfred Marshall um, started the Cambridge School, Irving Fisher in America, started to put more math into economics. And I think the subject has moved into um, far down that um, area. And one of the consequences of being more mathematical is that you start to look at narrower questions which can be answered um, more precisely rather than the bigger questions which are messier um, to answer both in terms of mathematical equations but also data. Um, but I think economics is now moving back towards the kinds of economists that I write about, the ones with the big ideas, the seminal ideas. So it may not be easy to fix why wages are low or how you get out of debt deflation because obviously Japan hasn't been gotten out of it, so just reflating the economy is not enough. So even if the answers aren't perfect and you vehemently disagree over how to approach it, having the big ideas around innovation, around growth, around um, the kinds of um, topics that the great economists covered, um, those are probably more useful. It makes economics more relevant. And I think this is where economics is beginning um, to shift uh, towards. Um, so I think, um, you know, one of the things that I found in writing this book is that when there is a time of change or crisis or breakdown of consensus around a topic, whether it's trade or globalization or uh, economists themselves, that's a time for re-examination. That, that tends to be where the big ideas come from. So the example that I'll give you is we think of Joseph Schumpeter as the creator of a creative destruction. So he is the person who carefully studied industries. And this is a really, again, big picture economist. He looked at um, industries across the world and said, which ones are innovative? Why are they innovative? And what impact do they have on the economy? So this is what he's best known for, groundbreaking research in terms of how you think about innovation. But he also, his best known work, he also changed the debate around communism and democracy. His best known work is actually called Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. So after World War II, there was a massive um, increase in communist and socialist countries. And Joseph Schumpeter's book equated capitalism with democracy. And in many ways, he won the day because most of the world moved towards market-based economies rather than communist and socialist economies. So I think it's those big ideas, not in silos, not constrained by equations, that made the great economists great. And I think this is a good time for economics to try that path again. Linda Yu, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The Great Economists is out now. Uh, recommend you go and get a copy.